Doing all speech delivery? Okay. Any other sign announcements? Palacios. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. Buenos dias. I love it. Um, just before I start, what's my time check? What, what? I don't want to get in trouble. Okay. Awesome. And then can I have a clicker too? Or it's all good. It is, right. It is so hard to go after Maria because she's so energetic and bubbly and a phenomenal friend and mentor and colleague. So I'm excited to be here with you all today. Again, my name is Edgar Palacios, um, Palacios, as some people would say. Um, and I am the founder of an organization called Revolución Educativa, or RevEd for short. Um, it is an organization that's working on building power within the Latino community around issues of education. It's also an affiliated organization to the C3 that I run called Latinx Education Collaborative. And that organization is really thinking critically about Latino representation in schools. So we tend to support Latino educators, administrators, um, young people who want to get into the education profession. Um, and we're really trying to champion this idea that when students see themselves reflected in the teachers that serve them, they're going to have better educational outcomes and experiences. Um, before I get into all of that, um, I'm going to share a little bit about my own personal journey and why this work is so important to me. Um, I think as part of it, I assume most of you are entrepreneurs, business owners, and folks, fantastic. We all know how critical our, our own journeys are in like, the effectiveness of our work. And so um, my journey starts in Miami Beach, Florida, where I was born in the late 1900s, as the young people would say. Um, <laughs> My parents came to this country from Nicaragua. Um, they were fleeing civil war at the time and they arrived in 1981. Um, and so when they arrived, they had no plans of having me and I showed up a couple of years later. Um, and I, I was born in Miami. And how, how many of you have been to Miami? There's beaches and like food and like fun stuff all the time. And that's how I grew up. I grew up, I was there till roughly fifth grade. Um, and I grew up in a really global wor world, right? Like you could hear any different languages, you could eat any from food from anywhere. And I thought like, I thought Miami was like everywhere, right? Um, and then between the summer of fifth and sixth grade, my family moved to Spokane, Washington. <laughs> and I don't know if you know where Spokane is. <laughs> it's right over there, roughly 3000 miles away. We had a five day road trip where we took all of our stuff and moved it to Spokane. And I was really surprised. Um, I remember the moment that we crossed into like Florida um, and there was like nothing there but swamp. And I was like, what is this? Um, but in Spokane, it was missing two things. Beaches, sunshine. sunshine, and at that time, Latinos. And so I was really confused. I was like, wait a second, where are my people? Where's my community? How does this work? And one of the stories that I share that still sticks with me and drives my work is this, this moment when I go into cl my class in sixth grade, it's my first day of sixth grade, and my teacher, Miss Mulvey, an exceptional, wonderful lady, comes out and welcomes me in into the classroom and she makes me feel at home and I'm like, this is going to be great, I like her already. And then I sit down next to a young lady named Lindsay and the first thing that I hear from Lizzie is, Lindsay is, I don't want to sit to a dirty Mexican. And that is the the like the seed of what like gets me started on my work. Um, two things that I found confusing about that statement. One, I'm not Mexican. Uh, my family's from Nicaragua. And so if anything, so Nicaraguense, right? I'm from, that's my heritage. And then two, I showered that day. <laughs> and I, I think I put a healthy dose of Dracar Noir back. So I was smelling good. So definitely not dirty. Um, but that's my journey, right? So that's how I get to sixth grade and learned a lot around racism, discrimination, and just that kind of side of the world. And then three years later, we moved to Cape Girardeau, Missouri. <laughs> and Cape Girardeau, Missouri has some things in common with Spokane. The first, that there are no beaches there, but there is a Cape. Uh, there's water, there's the Mississippi, the beautiful Mississippi. And you know, the Latino community isn't as strong there either, right? And so 
experiencing some challenges there, but then I ended up in Kansas City in 2004. Um, and it took me about 10, 10 years to actually like find Latinos and, and, and find the community and be integrated and engaged. And so that's part of my journey and part of why this work is so meaningful to me. Um, what, what does power look like in our community and why is that important? Um, recently, we um, engaged in an effort that was led by the parents that we serve around saving schools. So at some point in last year, um, Kansas City Public School System decided that they were going to close 10 schools, right? And nobody likes to close down schools. That is not a thing that people want to do. Uh, but there, th there were roughly three schools um, that they were going to close in my neighborhood that served Latino students, that were serving them well. Our parents felt like they were safe. Our parents felt like there was a strong community there. And so we got to work. Parents came to us and said, we need your help in amplifying our voices and really thinking about what can we do to support these efforts. And so um, that's Dalia right there. Dalia is an incredible and exceptional organizer. She didn't know she was an organizer, but she rallied all her families at James Elementary. And she, I think, is one of the determining factors as to why that, sc that school remained open and eight other schools also remained open, right? So that's the kind of work that we do. It's not about whatever agenda we have. Our agenda is really around representation, right? Making sure that our, our, the positions of influence and power within our community are also are representative of the communities that live within, within in those spaces. Um, another program that we do is called Educatec, and it is a digital literacy program. We find that a lot of our folks are struggling with accessing computers and accessing email. And when you have parents <laughs> that want to communicate schools, schools tend to communicate with emails, right? Digitally and whatnot. And so we are building a community of digitally literate folks um, who are able to engage and connect and understand how to work this. That is such a powerful thing. Like communication is critical. That is why Maho's business, I call her Maho because that's, that's her, your, your nickname, right? Lo estoy diciendo bien? Yeah, um, because information is critical, right? How many of you have ever gone to a place where you didn't understand the language? What does that feel like when you walk into that space? Scary, Scary? right? What else? Confusing? Confusing? Frustrating. Frustrating, right? And one thing that I love about our country is that we do a phenomenal job of, we have great marketing, right? The rest of the world hears us and we say, we are the best country in the world. We're a place where opportunity exists. We're a place that can help you go far and above in life, right? And like, we have this great marketing. And then you come to this country and you're like, wait a second, Ugh, it's a little more difficult than we thought, right? That promise of, of, of the American life can become a little bit more difficult. And part of that, that difficulty is language access, right? So that's something that we're constantly thinking about. The reason I think Maho's work is critical is because there are very few places in our communities that actually have reliable information in Spanish. And so that's kind of the work that we do with Educatec. I'm ensuring that folks are at least having another avenue of connecting and understanding information. We also have a really interesting program called Ayuda KC, which is a hotline for Spanish dominant families. Um, where they are calling us and saying, hey, we need help in navigating schools. How many of you are parents? How many of you have had difficulty navigating schools and school systems? Yes, no different for our community, right? And so what we've learned is that we walk alongside our families to ensure that they have positive experiences. And what we find is that when we're alongside them, things tend to move a little bit more quickly than they would otherwise. So that's part of our work that we do. And we also get engaged in the legislative process, right? There are a lot of policies that are in place that are not beneficial to our community. And I would also say, suggest that they're not beneficial to everyone else in the community. And so we get folks who are interested in engaging in the process, knowing that while some folks may not vote, they do have a voice in this community and they have a, 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 an offering. And so we love to take them to spaces like um, the Capitol building and remind them that that is our house, right? That is our, our space and our building. And so it is good to engage in that process. And this is my favorite slide because this is where I stop talking a little bit um, and tell you the T of the organization. So if you have any questions for me, um, how am I doing on time? Fantastic. If you have questions for me of how the process works or a little bit more about the entrepreneurial journey there, I'm happy to answer them. 
<laughs> they will now. Thank you for that. No, um, so I, um, I started the organization in 2018. So I'll share a little bit about that journey. Um, I started the organization as a 501c3 in 2018. And then I also filed for the 501c4 for RevEd at that time. Um, it has been, a, it's hard to get nonprofit like grants. It is hard to get that kind of funding. It is hard to build up the relationships necessary to do that. Um, we got a seed grant in 2017 um, for roughly $60,000, which seems like a lot of money, but it really isn't because a lot of that money goes directly to the programs. Um, thankfully, um, we had funders from national organizations and national philanthropy that came and observed our work and thought it was meaningful, which then allowed us actually to fundraise locally. So sometimes you have to go outside of your own community to get validated for your work. Um, so other dollars can come in and flow. So a lot of our fundraising is rooted in three things. It is in corporate, not, not corporate, but philanthropic funding. So our, our, our funders, um, it is in individual donors. And so we have a healthy um, list of donors who have supported our work. And then every once in a while, we will do a small contract with the district or our school to help them um, create better practices for engaging Latino students in their schools. Um, and so, yeah, funding is... Yeah, is Money is important and nonprofits are expensive. <laughs> yes. Um, I just wanted to comment. Uh, so I run a, a branding and creative storytelling agency yeah. here in this area. I just wanted to comment that I really like your branding. I think it lends a lot of legitimacy and it's, it's really fun. I really like it. I appreciate that. Um, I, it's actually fun. Humor is one of my top values. And so I think while this work can be difficult and draining and um, really challenging, like you have to have fun, right? Like you have to enjoy doing the work. You have to enjoy being with your community. You have to enjoy like navigating difficult situations. And so I really appreciate that comment. Um, and Canva, can we talk about Canva? Because Canva <laughs> is an incredible tool. Um, anyone can use it. If I can use it and create a little bit of fun slides, like I also do recommend actual like designers and whatnot that helps out. <laughs> But um, Canva is a phenomenal tool for um, smaller enterprises. Yes? Uh, more, more than a question, I wanted if you can share the story that happened, I think, in two or three weeks ago about when on Revit we were able to put the fire with the Secretary of Education. Yes. And, and, and a comment really quickly. You hear briefly that I was working in the school <coughs> district. I came to them because that, um, and, and this is how I crossed with them, and also the the region that you have now, because I know that you, it's Kansas City, but it's not Kansas City. Yeah. It's Broward. So. Something, so I appreciate that question. So we were invited to join Secretary of Education Miguel Cardona um, a few weeks ago, and we were able to gather parents to share their kind of feedback with them, right? And so that was a really interesting process because a lot of parents don't think that that opportunity is even possible. Um, they don't even know, sometimes they don't even know the magnitude of having a conversation with this department, like the secretary of education, right? And so that was a really powerful moment for our, our community. And it's interesting because like we hold, we will c correspond with his team and say like, hey, here are some of the promises that you made to our parents. And so like, when are you going to deliver on them, right? Um, which is a little less than Kansas City nice, but also like, you know, it helps us get there. You talked about community, and one thing that I didn't give you was some numbers. Um, so in the greater Kansas City metro area, there are roughly 52,000 Latino students. In across the country, Latino students make up 25% of K-12 students, and that number is gonna be one out of three within the next five, 10, 10 years, if not earlier. And ultimately, you're gonna see the majority of students in this country are gonna be Latino students, and a strong portion of them will be multilingual learners. So that's one important thing to think about. When we think about teachers in the greater Kansas City metro area, only 1% of teachers are Latino. That's roughly 260 teachers. Um, that number is actually not that different across the Midwest. Um, we, our work has expanded into the state of Kansas, and so we have some relationships in the state of Kansas. We also are looking, exploring and supporting some schools in St. Louis. And we're also in Indianapolis. And so Indianapolis has reached out to us and started some seed granting with us to help support the cultivation of their Latino educators. Our work is really cemented in this idea of community building. A lot of the people that we serve feel like they're the only ones in their buildings. They feel like they're the only ones in their districts. 
and they may not know that they're a part of a larger community. And so if you're gonna retain a teacher, a really great strategy around that is to build a community of support around them. And that's what we're doing, right? We're, we're saying like, you're not crazy, you're not alone, these things are happening. And then also how do we prepare you for the difficult job of being a, an, an educator, right? How do we make sure that you feel supported in these ways? Um, of course, we're also struggling against the national trends around teaching, right? There's a lot of narratives around teaching, um, how teaching is not a sustainable job, how difficult it is, how crazy parents can be, all these things that prevent young people from wanting to become educators. The issue is, for me, and this is a personal one, who's gonna teach you how to do the stuff? Right. If you don't want to be an educator, who, like if you want to be a business person, who's, if you want to be uh, um, an engineer, if you want to be a doctor, like you have to go through an education process. And so we have to figure out how to support our professionals in that way and ensure that our young people are being taught well um, and that they have the necessary resources available to them to be successful. Yes. It's a great question. Um, so in 2018, uh, it was me, and it was me for free. And I got to shout out my wife, uh, Laura Palacios, who like, when we had a really difficult conversation of like, hey, I want to do this. And she was like, do it. And I'm like, but it's going to take a hit on the budget. And she's like, we're going to take a hit on the budget. Um, so she was my first investor. I will I always say that. Um, now we have a team of 10 across both organizations. Um, collectively, it is a $1.6 million annual budget. Um, and five years from now, I don't know. The, fun, the, the fundraising landscape in our community right now is interesting. So a lot of the major funders that we have have had shifts in leadership over the last three months. And so with shifts in leadership comes shift in strategy and shift in investment priorities. And so who knows what's gonna happen. Um, one thing that I heard a professor, Dr. Howard Fuller, he's really popular in the education space. He said to be committed to your purpose and not the mechanism, right? So I think about that from an organizational perspective. The LEC and RevEd are mechanisms. There are ways to get this work done. Um, I think a lot of our team members are committed to the purpose. They are on purpose when they're doing their work. And so if the LEC or RevEd fail to exist one day, these are folks that are really well prepared to go on and lead their own initiatives or continue their work in a different way. So I'm hopeful that in five years, we're gonna be a Midwestern organization or regional organization supporting a community similar to this one um, across the Midwest, because my idea is absolutely right. Um, I have a theory in what I call the Midwest Latino. Um, it, is, it is a community that like, is so ripe for activation, right? It's a community that is growing and burgeoning, but still is still a little modest in the way that they engage with the world. It's different when you go to Miami, where I'm from. In Miami, Latinos are in power, they're the mayors, like they're th these folks, right? And so that's what I see and that's my foundation, which allows me to believe that it's possible in our communities here. And I'm not suggesting that we take up space away from anybody else. I'm just saying that we actually engage in these ways that are gonna be helpful for our entire community. Um, we believe that diversity is important and we believe that that cultural asset that our community brings to the table makes life a little bit more fun um, and a little bit more enjoyable. So, yeah, thanks for the question. Yes. I, I just, going back to the education piece, you know, in KCK, I don't know if people knew this, but 81 languages are represented in KCK school district. It's the second most next to Miami. Yeah. Which is just fascinating, just 30 minutes, 45 minutes down the road, that language barrier is so real. Yeah. And so, yeah, I just, I, I think awareness is, we don't know. Yeah. It's just crazy. So yeah, I commend you for what you're doing and you're obviously super passionate about it. So I appreciate yeah, that. You're gonna do well. Thank you. Yeah, I, I'll say one thing to that. Um, it's that Spanish is the second most popular language in this country, right? And so, and Latinos and Spanish has, have been around in this country for centuries. And so sometimes I'm a little challenged by this idea that we can't find folks who speak it or that we can't find folks that can help support these initiatives because they exist. I think what we have to start thinking about is like workforce development a little bit differently, right? Um, one thing that we've done because I'm bilingual and I can speak both in Spanish and English is I will also hire just monolingual Spanish folks because I can, they, they have the skill set to do work. Um, 
I just need to be able to communicate and then they can do what they need to do, right? Because we have a whole community of folks who speak Spanish that aren't going to speak English. And so that's one strategy that I'm sharing with people. It's like find bilingual folks, hire them, but also invest in monolingual folks that are going to ultimately pick up the language because that's what you do when you're in this country, right? You're surrounded by it. So it's going to happen. Yes. Uh, just quickly, so you have one or two nonprofits. Two. Two. Yes. And with the 501c3 registered in the state of Missouri? Yes. Okay. And uh, what's its name and then what's its mission statement? The Latinx Education Collaborative, and it is um, to increase the representation of Latino educators in K-12. Okay. Yes. And I do have the tax ID number if you need it to. <laughs> I'll look it up. Thank you. Uh, yes. A uh, follow-up to that question. You said you had a 5013C with one of them, the other one a 501. 501C4. Oh, cool. Yeah. Why the different uh, structures? And then uh, you might explain the difference between C3 and C4. Absolutely. Um, so the government is a funny thing, right? Um, how many of you uh, love bureaucracy? <laughs> So nonprofit organizations, 501c3s, charities, um, they're allowed to receive tax deductible donations, right? You can make a contribution to it and then we can send you a receipt thanking you for your donation and you can ultimately take it off your taxes in one way or another. Um, what that doesn't allow you to do, that status, is to engage politically or in policy um, or to lobby. There's, there's actually, that's not necessarily true. A c3 has a limit on the amount of lobbying power that you can have. A 501c4 is a very different organization. Um, the C4 allows you to engage politically. It allows you to engage in elections. It allows you to engage um, in lobbying. And it also, what it does is that you don't actually have to talk about who your donors are, right? A C3, you have to display your donors and give all that information out. A C4 doesn't have to do that. Um, it becomes a question of transparency and like values and all these other things. Um, but it's really interesting because it's a model that I see a lot of organizations nationally have, right? So like the American Cancer Society, it will have a C3 and a C4. Um, the Sierra Club is going to have a C3 and a C4. And so what it allows, it allows you to have additional access to tools. Other differences, we have two different complete boards and we have two different complete strategies. The thing is that they are affiliated to one another. And so the, the missions are working collectively on for me, it's the, to create the necessary conditions for the advancement of Latino youth in our community. So, so basically, one of the, two, uh, the, the, the three uh, has to be transparent yeah. and more public, yeah. like a public entity, whereas the C4 can be a little more anonymous and yes. more like a private business. Absolutely. Yes. Do you, have, do you offer any classes or do you have resources? suggestions for people who want to learn Spanish and connect more with the Latino community? Um, I do. And now, Maria is going to be better at St. Joseph Resources there. But I will say that one thing that I've seen that's really popular, that's really cool, is the districts are actually taking responsibility for that. And so in Kansas City Public Schools, you actually have um, school, uh, Carver Dual Language, if I'm not mistaken, that is offering Spanish classes. And so they have, I think, a, um, a group of 15 educators that are taking Spanish on site so they can better communicate with the students. Um, so that's one resource. Two, I would hang out um, at some of the bigger major events within the Latino community. So we have the, other, the Muertos coming up um, in, at the end of October. So you're going to see some stuff pop up. So Maddie Rhodes is a great place for that in Kansas City. Guadalupe Centers is another great place for that. Um, two, I... When I want to practice my Spanish, um, I will call Maddie. <laughs> um, I have, I'm lucky that I can talk to my parents, right? And my parents um, will not address me in English. And so um, it can be awkward sometimes because I, sometimes I will forget the words. And my mom is a Spanish professor. So she has really high standards for my Spanish. <laughs> um, and so sometimes I'm like, I don't know, sorry. Or I'll tell her, you didn't teach me that. So, you know, I, I put the responsibility back on her. <laughs> when you do, like schools, do they provide a environment, you know, and I don't know what St. Joseph School District is doing. My daughter actually lives in the exact neighborhood you're talking about. All yeah. the schools are in her neighborhood um, in Kansas City. Are they hosting events that are, are Spanish-speaking driven, but inviting in the English-speaking community to learn more, be a part of it, feel it. I mean, are they, are the school districts doing that? Because there are families like you that want to learn and want to be a part of it. 
On the whole, I would say that's not a, an active practice. I do think that as we're bringing attention and awareness to the needs of the community, you're starting to see more creative folks uh, or more well, creative ways of doing that. You know, like we have PTA. Yeah. What if there was a Spanish-speaking PTA at a, you know, to help those families connect and they have their school carnival that we all Can participate in? Absolutely. <laughs> I'm a PTA mom, and in the PTA board, there's no one that speaks Spanish. Like, last year, they were in one of the dinners at Latinos Connect does, and they were asking for more people to get involved in the PTA board. And there's a lot of moms in the Latino community that are starting very more involved in the PTAs at their schools, but there's no um, activity or involvement for the kids inside the schools to be connected and do activities like that resembles the Hispanic heritage. Like I even asked the, the director of my kids' school, like, oh, are you guys gonna do something for Hispanic Heritage Month? Because I see that you do multiple yeah. things. Like, no, that's up to the teachers. And I was like, that should be something yeah. that we should do. Like, I know in Kansas City they do in yeah. multiple schools. And I was like, that will be something good for the kids that they see something that resembles their community because we celebrate also, everything else here in the school. But they don't have that kind of program. I hope <coughs> and I wish they will be more progressive in the years to come because. Us in the community, we're trying to like be more <coughs> proactive and try to help. And there's moms that and dads too that want to help that happen. Like we can help them through the process. There's bilingual people here in the community in St. Joe that have the time and they want to put the time to make that happen for our kids and connect both communities. Like we always say, if one community, we live in the same place. Our kids go to the same school. If there's kids that are bilingual, there are other ones that come here and they don't speak the language, and they communicate. I, I don't even know how they communicate yeah. because sometimes it's hard. Yeah. But if kids, they try. Like us as, as an adult, we need to try harder for mm -hmm. them to make a safe space yeah. and connect them and be more have more empathy. Mm -hmm. and I, I will add. Um, we just want our kids to embrace their Hispanity. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't want them to be Americanized. We don't want to be. Uh, we don't want. Nothing wrong with that. Yeah, we don't want them <laughs> pretend to be American because uh, we are Latinos. We are Spanish, so we want them to embrace who they are, to mm -hmm. be proud mm -hmm. for being Latino, for being Hispanic. And uh, growing up, uh, that thing is very important for us. I have a, a friend. She's from Cuba. She's uh, also a PTA mom as, as myself like myself, and, but she doesn't speak English. And the first minute she was, uh, what are you saying? And I was trying to translate everything. But it was hard for, the, for her because she said, well, I'm gonna do whatever you do, so just tell me. And, but she was trying so hard to be involved with the, with the kids, with the schools, uh, but she can't because there's a barrier about the language. Mm -hmm. So I can understand, I have, a, I have a broken English, I know, and I'm working on that, but she don't even understand even a word. So that, that's hard. And um, she felt frustrated because how can she help their kids for the, uh, with the home, uh, homework? Mm -hmm. How they can uh, speak with the teacher? It's hard, really. It's really hard. I'm doing great, my son. No worries. Um, <laughs> I only have a comment. Since I see interest here, I have an idea that I want to show to Bobby. So Dia de Muertos is something huge to happen in this area. I know there are a lot of people who disagree with you. But I used to think that we are part of the Kansas City. <laughs> and if you can go there, it's something that you can experience that you never get. So we can find maybe a bus to go from here. So go there, have fun, and come back safely. If 10,000 people show up, 10,000 people, it's blocks after blocks, blocks after blocks, with activities that they do in Kansas <coughs> and, and good opportunity for people to learn and, and, and being more connected and live with this tradition that is not Mexico, but is the biggest culture, and, and have this opportunity for to start learning, and, and have what I say, this tiny conversation when they know somebody uh, new, so they can connect. Oh, I know what you talk to, <coughs> you know? So they can feel more welcome. Yes. Do you have 
a program for uh, Latinos mm -hmm. or migrants coming to this country. When they initially get here, a two-week program called Head Start or something, that you teach them the culture and you teach them some of the phrases of our language, because that's, and the reason why I say that, yeah. I was in the military. Yeah. So when I went to Germany, I had two weeks of learning, Training. learning German. When I went to Korea, I had two weeks of learning some Korean to get by, and then you pick up on the language. So if you have a program in place that helps them when they get here to understand our culture and our language and that kind of thing, I yeah, I appreciate that. We don't. That's a great idea, and so I'm likely going to steal it. So just name it to here. <laughs> but I'll, I'll say this: there are other organizations in Kansas City that are really concerned. Like our their 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 base is immig immigrants, right? And so Jewish Vocational Service they do a lot of work in Kansas City around integrating immigrants into the space. Um, this is some of the work of the school districts as well as they're like working through their students and families are doing some of that. But I do think it's a good idea. I will, yeah, there's, I love it. Go ahead. And I know we're at time, we're past time, so I want to make sure. So um, if you guys don't mind just hanging around. Yeah, here, absolutely. So then everybody can just ask some questions. So, all right. Thank you so much, everyone. See you next week. Great presentation. Thank you. Thank you.